The red sky. OP stepped out of his pickup truck, the relentless rain doing nothing to improve his mood as he carried the box toward the small store. He noticed the candle shop next door, which seemed to explain Mary's peculiar choice in shoe shops. Can I help you? The store clerk asked, her tone less than welcoming. I need to return these, they're the wrong size, Richard explained, setting the box and receipt on the counter. Why are they being returned? The clerk pressed. If you were listening, you'd know they're the wrong size, Richard replied, his voice calm. What size do you need? She asked, her patience wearing thin. Size 14 triple E, he answered. We only carry up to 13 E, she retorted. I'm well aware, I'm puzzled why my wife thought these would fit, Richard remarked, presenting the shoes and receipt. Is there an issue, Estelle? Another older woman inquired sharply. The two scrutinized the shoes, Richard maintaining a neutral expression, hoping they wouldn't find an excuse to deny the return. We can give you store credit, the manager finally said. I might as well call my credit card company and dispute the charge. My wife didn't use store credit for this purchase, Richard responded tersely. Is this how you treat all your customers? As he left the store, Richard mused silently on their attitude. Outside, the rain continued its steady beat as he got back into his truck and drove to the store he had originally suggested to Mary. Stanley's has the large sizes I need, he muttered to himself, parking the truck. Of course, they don't have a candle shop or a pet store nearby, just a tire shop and Brick's Pizza. Why did she go all the way across town instead? Shaking his head, he walked into Stanley's. Welcome to Stanley's. How can I help? Oh, Mr. Trahan. Greeted a young blonde woman as he entered, her recognition evident as the door chime rang. Richard offered a hesitant smile. The woman before him clearly recognized him, even pronouncing his name correctly as Traha, unlike most in the small Colorado town who said Trahan. Oh my goodness, it is you. She exclaimed with joy. Hi, how have you been? I've been good, reached the semifinals last year, and competed in the physics bowl divisionals. Just gearing up for another year at St. Pius, Richard replied, his words faltering as he tried to remember the cheerful woman in front of him. You're still teaching and coaching, then. She inquired, walking with him towards the men's shoe section. Yes, need to pay the bills, he responded with a nod. I completely get it, she said with a smile. Miss, I'm embarrassed to say I can't quite place you, though you clearly know me, Richard admitted. I'm sorry, she laughed. It's been three years. Wow, three years. She paused, lost in thought. Richard almost chuckled, to someone in her late teens or early twenties, three years must seem significant. If you think that's long, wait until you hit your fifties, he thought to himself. Oh, I'm Mandy Wolf. you were my algebra teacher, she revealed. Richard recalled teaching algebra to younger students at St. Pius Catholic High School. Was it about three years ago? He pondered aloud. Yes, that's right, Mandy confirmed. With a friendly smile, Richard remembered how he would correct his students in formal responses in class, encouraging them to use proper grammar. He found the black wing at Oxford's he was looking for and requested a size 14 EE. Mandy glanced briefly at his feet before heading to the stockroom. As Richard watched her leave, he noted her petite stature, standing around 5 feet 2 or 3, making her significantly shorter than him. With his background as a football coach, he had become adept at estimating physical attributes. He noted her as being fuller figured. Her hair was styled in a short bob, curling under to graze her neck. At the threshold of the stockroom, she turned, giving Richard a smile marked by dimples, before disappearing behind the door. Amanda Wolf, from junior year, Richard suddenly recalled. Back then, she was notably heavier, her hair longer, and her youthful face was hidden beneath a flurry of blemishes. Amanda had repeated her junior year, struggling academically at Benhurst Academy, particularly with algebra, scoring only a 43. Her academic challenges continued at St. Pius, where she barely passed algebra with a 55 and failed English and biology. Without attending summer school, she never returned for the next academic year. In a school of just over 200 students, Richard, juggling roles as the mathematics teacher, and the football coach had little time to dwell on the struggles of one student. Okay, we have it, Mandy announced, beaming. And look at these. They're penny loafers, but with a comfort sole. Thought you might like them. For a size 14 triple E, Richard inquired, eyeing the burgundy shoe she presented. Yes, that's right, Mandy confirmed. Richard sat down, and Mandy brought over a stool, deftly lacing the wingtip Oxford. As he watched her, he noticed the absence of the acne that once marred her face, and her focused expression was punctuated by a slight pout. Didn't see you back at St. Pious, what happened after? Richard asked kindly. I left school, she replied. Left school? Richard echoed, the news striking a chord with him. As a teacher, he found it disheartening to hear of anyone dropping out. He knew of another dropout, Noel Childress, who carried her status almost as a badge of honor. Her defiant attitude made Richard cautious about discussing education in her presence. Did you manage to get your jet? He inquired softly. Her gaze met his, and she shook her head without a word. Just couldn't grasp it while I was there, she explained. How was I supposed to pass the tests? Richard opted for the wing at Oxford's, finding the penny loafers comfortable yet hesitating at their hefty price tag. Maybe next time, Mandy offered with a smile. 
Perhaps, Richard replied, echoing her cheerfulness. After he departed, Mandy shelved the loafers and took a brief moment to herself in the small staff restroom, overwhelmed by her fleeting encounter. Richard was undeniably attractive, his age obscured by his charm. His dark, thick hair was interspersed with gray, and his eyes were a deep brown, his face sun-kissed from outdoor life. Richard's past as a college football wide receiver had endowed him with an athletic build, broad shoulders tapering to a still slender waist, his muscular legs hinting at his athletic prowess. Back in her high school days, Mandy remembered hearing about how Richard, then a coach, would train vigorously with his players, promising dinners to anyone who could outpace him. Only once did he have to make good on that promise, testament to his enduring fitness. Meanwhile, Richard, now away from the store, was grappling with domestic matters, contemplating attending a concert he had no interest in, simply to please his partner, Mary. He presented the concert plan to her, only to learn she had made arrangements with her friends, leaving him to navigate his feelings of exclusion and consideration for her interests. Oh, Richard uttered. He pondered asking her why she opted to spend time with those two assertive friends instead of her husband. But, as was often the case, Richard chose to remain silent on the issue. Then, Mary started grumbling about the patio needing cleaning, as she had invited Noel, Chrissy, and the neighbors for the following evening. She asked if he could check the propane for the grill since Noel was planning to make vegetarian skewers, and whether the outdoor lights were functioning. Of course, Mary, I'll take care of that right after you bring me the shoes you picked up for me, Richard responded. What? I did, Mary retorted, I showed them to you earlier today. But they weren't the right size, Mary, Richard pointed out. What? No, they were correct, Mary insisted, let me show you. They were size 13E, Mary. That's not my size, Richard explained, unlocking the door to the back porch. No, the salesperson mentioned they were larger in size, didn't you try them? Mary continued. Be careful, Toby's trying to slip out. All right, troublesome cat, want to go outside? I'll let you, Richard grumbled, directing his frustration more at Mary than at the orange tabby. No, Mary yelled, dashing to intercept the mischievous feline. Richard blocked the cat with his foot, stepping out to quickly tidy the outdoor furniture, and checked the propane tank, confirming it was full. He cleaned the grill racks with a wire brush. By the time Richard was on the patio, the rain had stopped. He finished his outdoor tasks by cleaning the hot tub cover, then re-entered the house. Daddy didn't mean to upset you, he wouldn't really let you out, Mary was soothing the cat. Tell him, Daddy, say it. I stand by my words, Richard declared as he headed to the basement door. Just give the word, and I'll let you out, even point out the coyotes. Daddy, Mary exclaimed in shock. Richard descended the stairs, ignoring Mary's ongoing tirade. In the basement, Darren, the black and white cat, was stealthily stalking a dust bunny, while Samantha, the Himalayan, squeezed herself between the washing machine and dryer. Neither of you keen on escaping? Richard inquired playfully. Just give me a sign, okay? He tossed his towel into the washing machine, added the rest of the laundry, checking carefully to prevent any dark clothes from mingling and potentially staining the lighter fabrics. Then he set the machine going. Upon returning upstairs, Mary continued her complaints. We're upset with you, she declared. And, Richard retorted, indifferent. Given that my thoughts don't matter to you, why should yours matter to me? What do you mean by that? Mary pressed, following him to their bedroom, her tone rising with every step. Richard paused, reflecting on their history. They had first crossed paths at Missouri River State University during a celebration after a notable football victory against Norman College's Bulls. The game was memorable, with their team, the Pioneers, defeating the touted Bulls 18-7 through an unexpected strategy. Unstoppable. Hardly, Jerry Jamili, the senior quarterback, had boasted post-game. He then called Richard over with a mix of jest and camaraderie. Their banter was playful and rough, a common language on the field. At that party, Tricia, a cheerleader, introduced Richard and the quarterback to Mary, a newcomer in sorority pledge, before vanishing with a teammate, leaving Mary in Richard's unexpected care. Curiosity tinged with the effects of the evening's indulgences. Mary asked Richard about the nickname she overheard, her words slightly slurred by the beer she'd consumed. Poon ass, Richard explained with a grin, I'm Cajun. It's a term some find insulting, but we take pride in it. Supposedly, it's the one thing we won't eat. You're Cajun, Mary inquired, her expression puzzled. What does that mean? It means he's from the bayou, Eric Sneed called out, somewhat inebriated. Grew up among the alligators, and his family's history is as tangled as swamp roots. Might as well have webbed feet, the way he navigates the water. Means I don't tolerate nonsense, Richard interjected, playfully nudging Eric aside. Richard shared with Mary that he hailed from DeGarde, Louisiana, and was in Missouri on a full scholarship from the university. Tricia checked in on Mary before moving on to mingle with another football player. Mary, left unattended, drank excessively, became sick, and lost consciousness. Richard, aware of the reckless behavior at these parties, decided to ensure her safety. Let's get you home, Mary Rossini, Richard said, helping the unsteady girl outside. 
After a challenging ride, during which Mary got sick several times, Richard managed to get her to her sorority house. Finding it empty and Mary unable to locate her room, he carefully placed her on the couch on her stomach, positioned a wastebasket nearby, and then left. Days later, an upset Tricia confronted Richard in the cafeteria, accusing him of misconduct. Richard calmly explained the actual events and walked away. However, Tricia persisted with her accusation, leading to discontent within the sorority due to the mess and smell resulting from the incident. With no real recollection of the night, Mary only remembered meeting someone Cajun. To defend her actions, Tricia escalated the issue to the Greek Council. The hearing seemed biased until Richard brought forward three football players who contradicted Tricia's account, highlighting her negligence towards the pledge. All I did was ensure she was safe at home. What happened after that is beyond me, Richard stated. Tricia faced the three confident football players with a sharp look. They simply returned her gaze with equal intensity. Is this how it's going to be after everything? Tricia spat out angrily. Come on, you're not the only one in the picture, one of them retorted with a dismissive laugh. And let's be honest, there's nothing extraordinary about it. Richard then brought forward a former pledge who revealed to the council that Tricia had left her alone at a party. Without Richard's intervention, the pledge felt lost and eventually left the university, feeling both embarrassed and angry. Patricia Loudermilk, the president of the Greek council inquired, scrutinizing Tricia intently. Am I done here? Asked Richard. Do you need more evidence? You could even check the front seat of my car where the girl got sick. No, Richard, you can leave, said the sergeant at arms, still looking at Tricia with a cold expression. Traha, Richard corrected him. Mary Rossini, another pledge, also decided to leave the sorority. Unlike the first pledge, she stayed at the university and later thanked Richard for his help. Mary wasn't the type Richard usually went for, he preferred tall blondes with striking features, unlike the petite, earnest brunette from a devout family, intent on saving herself for marriage. However, he appreciated her admiration. Mary might have been innocent in some ways, but she had her skills, and they shared a mutual appreciation for each other's company. Richard realized there might be something special between them. After the football season, Richard had an opportunity to go to Canada, but he chose instead to pursue his passion for teaching. He ended up at a tough high school in Colfax, Missouri, where he faced a dangerous situation on his very first day. A student confronted him with a switchblade, but Richard managed to disarm him and ensure the situation didn't escalate further. Once the student was disarmed, there was no need for further action, the vice principal pointed out. Richard replied, maintaining his composure, I had to make sure there were no more threats. Uh, well, next time. The man stammered. Mary was deeply moved by Richard's experiences and nearly forgot her initial reservations about their wedding night. She embraced Richard, overwhelmed with relief and affection, fearing she could have lost him. After Mary earned her liberal arts degree, Richard proposed, and she accepted with joy and tears. Richard had already become acquainted with Mary's family, including her sister Kathy Hinton and her parents, Albert and Sandra Rossini. Richard's mother had welcomed Mary warmly into her home the previous Christmas. During a conversation in Cajun French, Camille, Richard's mother, playfully questioned why Richard hadn't chosen a local Cajun girl, jokingly doubting Mary's culinary skills. Camille mentioned another local, Marie Duvalier, but Richard humorously dismissed the suggestion, leading to a light-hearted family banter. Eventually, they settled in Mary's hometown of Benhurst, Colorado, where they married at St. Catharines. Richard took a teaching position at St. Pius Catholic High School, accepting a lower salary for the benefit of future family education. Their family grew quickly with the arrival of Richard Andrew Tre and J.R., followed by Jacqueline Marie and then Andrew Jonathan, who narrowly missed sharing a birthday with Jacqueline. Tragedy struck when their twins, Peter Albert and Casey Elizabeth, were born. Casey passed away after three weeks due to a heart condition, leaving the family in profound grief. At the funeral, Mary, through tears, expressed a decisive family planning choice. The loss of Casey deeply affected their older children, Richie, Jackie, and Andy, who all mourned together. Richard remained silent, struggling to hold back tears as he looked at his daughter's small coffin. A week after the burial, when Mary suggested Richard consider a vasectomy, he half-jokingly proposed she undergo a tubal ligation instead. Why should I? It's a simple procedure for men, but it's a major operation for women, Mary countered. To me, it's a big deal either way, Richard retorted. Thus, Richard found himself in a familiar situation, akin to his younger days, purchasing contraceptives. At Skiff's pharmacy, he placed a large pack of condoms on the counter, prompting a knowing smile from the elderly cashier. Looks like you're planning a big celebration. She joked. I'm just being practical, Richard replied, explaining his year-long supply. The cashier laughed, predicting his return much sooner. Tragedy struck again shortly after the holiday season when Kathy's husband, Earl, succumbed to injuries from a car accident on Christmas. Richard, despite not being close to the outspoken Earl, served as a pallbearer, accepting the role with respect. Post-funeral, Kathy unexpectedly gave Richard Earl's watch, mentioning Earl's fondness for him. 
Richard, with a light-hearted response, acknowledged their unique acquaintance. Meanwhile, Richard, supporting his family, took on coaching roles at St. Pius, supplementing his income significantly. These extra earnings were crucial for the family's sustenance and savings, especially during the financially tight summer months. Eventually, the Trahans managed to buy a modest home in a working-class area, with Richard and a contractor converting the garage into a bedroom for the boys. In the neighborhood, Richard was affectionately known as Coach and his wife as Miss M.B. At Skiff's pharmacy, Richard placed a pack of protection items on the counter, next to a large bottle of antacid tablets and an ace bandage. The cashier glanced at the items, then back at Richard with a hint of awkwardness. Um, sir, these are, well, the larger size, she mumbled, trying to be discreet. Really now? Richard quipped, sparking a little laughter. The pharmacy manager emerged, curious about the commotion. Richard, the manager, and the cashier shared a light-hearted moment. However, when Richard recounted the story to Mary, she was not amused. You should have gone through with the procedure I mentioned, she remarked. It would save you from these trips. Years later, their family peace was disrupted when Richie, at 15, took his father's Rolex and pawned it. Richard initially settled the matter quietly and punished Richie with a grounding. Yet, Richie ignored the discipline, his actions growing more reckless. He took money from Mary and his siblings' savings. After he pawned the Rolex a second time, amidst Mary's loud objections, Richard reported the theft to the authorities. A public confrontation ensued, leading to the arrest of both Richard and Richie. Given his age, Richie could contact a parent and was released to his mother. That evening, he sneaked out and missed his court date, resulting in a warrant for his arrest. Meanwhile, Richard faced suspension from his job at St. Pius during the ongoing inquiry. Richard was firm in his dealings with Richie, but Mary was more lenient, causing strife between the couple. About ten months into this turmoil, just before Richie's sixteenth birthday, he was found deceased from a brain injury incurred after a fall, post-drug use. Instead of seeking help, the associates he was with pilfered his belongings, including his sneakers, and abandoned him. Shared adversities can sometimes cement the bond between a couple. The loss of their son, however, left Mary cold and resentful towards her husband, blaming him for their child's estrangement. Absolutely not. Richard retorted as Mary reiterated her accusations of his lack of empathy. For heaven's sake, Mary, Richard exclaimed. He was destroying our family. Andy, Peter, Jackie, they were all terrified of him. Do you feel relief now that he's gone? Mary accused loudly. Be reasonable, Mary, Richard countered with equal volume. Andy, Jackie, and Peter quickly learned they could twist their mother's grief to their advantage. If Jackie desired something pricey, mentioning Richie was her ticket. Her newfound driving freedom almost swayed Mary into purchasing her a new car. Naturally, Richard was cast as the villain, the one enforcing limits. 3 CS, 2 DS, and an F. He challenged, certainly not, no new car until your grades improve. Boom. Jackie protested loudly. This conflict nearly led to a marital split, with Richard temporarily leaving home, much to Andy and Jackie's smug satisfaction. During this time, Richard bunked on the couch of assistant principal Robert Driscoll. Over those months, Mary clung to her conviction of being correct. However, financial reality hit hard once Richard, who covered bills and other expenses, was no longer there. Dad, Mary sighed during a financial plea, I need some help. We can support you, Sandra, taking her daughter's side, suggested to Albert. It's the same, Albert responded. But don't you think you should talk things over with your husband and try to work things out? Father Dave from St. Catharines provided guidance to help them navigate their troubled waters through faith. After a few meetings, Richard and Mary committed to prioritizing their relationship. Upon Richard's return home, only Peter embraced him. Andy and Jackie held on to their grievances, feeling abandoned by Richard's departure and unimpressed by his nonchalant return. On what would have been Richie's 23rd birthday, tragedy struck when Kathy Hinton suffered a sudden brain aneurysm while at work, leaving everyone in shock. As before, Richard carried the burden of loss, serving as a pallbearer for Kathy, whom he cherished like a sister, not merely an in-law. It was discovered posthumously that Kathy had bequeathed her home to Mary Trahan. When Richard learned that the property was burdened with significant unpaid taxes, he took it upon himself to settle the debt. Expecting to consolidate their living situation by selling the ranch, Richard was taken aback by Mary's intense reaction, insisting on moving into the larger, better located house. Caught off guard, Richard suggested selling their current home instead, only to be met with hesitation from Mary. She envisioned Jackie and Andy remaining in the family home, with Jackie attending college part-time and Andy in a phase of self-discovery without employment. Peter, now a college freshman, chose a university that held sentimental value, being the alma mater of both his parents. With both their names tied to the family home and only Mary's on Kathy's property, Richard found himself in a financial strain, supporting two households and a college student. Despite its superior location, the new house required extensive repairs and upkeep, tasks that fell to Richard during his spare time. 
In this tense atmosphere, Richard confronted the painful reality of his strained relationship with Mary, especially when questioned about his feelings and opinions in what felt like a home that no longer recognized him. What were you supposed to do yesterday while I was at the garage with your car? Richard asked forcefully, pick up some shoes for you. And I did, Mary retorted. She let Toby go, and the cat immediately leaped onto the bed, heading straight for Richard's pillows. How many times do I have to tell you, I don't want your cats on my pillows? Richard growled, reaching for the cat. Don't be rough with him. Mary yelled, pushing Richard away. I told you to go to Stanley's, not Burke's. Stanley's, Richard fumed. I wanted size 14 triple E wing to Boxford's from Stanley's. Did you get them? No, because what I want never matters. It's always about what Mary wants, isn't it? Toby decided it was wise to leave the room quickly. I'm sorry, okay, Mary said defensively. The salesperson claimed they were size larger. They're not a full size larger, Mary. Think a little, will you? Richard commented. Here, give them to me. I'll return to the store right now, Mary said, getting agitated. And about Marcy Martin. You'd rather hang out with anyone else, no matter who, than go out with your own husband, Richard pointed out. You don't even like Marcy, Mary countered. That's not the point, Richard shot back. So what is the point then? Mary challenged. When was the last time we did anything together? Anything at all? Richard questioned. In the hot tub. Have we ever used it together? I spent $1,200 on that, thinking it could be something for us, maybe even bring us closer. But that never happened. I'm not fond of. Mary started. Oh, come on, Mary. Seriously. You don't want to argue with me, but when those two friends of yours come over, it's a whole different story, Richard said. I end up having to clean the pool filter every time they use it. It's always blocked up with debris, he complained. That's ridiculous, Mary retorted. See, see, no matter what I say, it's wrong. I'm always the mistaken one. Let's face it, Mary. My thoughts, my feelings, my preferences. They don't count, Richard said. Name one thing you've done just because I wanted it, Mary. Just one thing in the last year. Initially, Richard thought about sleeping in the guest room. But then he reminded himself that he was the one who paid for the expensive mattress that Mary insisted on. He was going to sleep in his own bed. The next evening, as the sun started to set, Chrissy and Noel arrived unannounced. They completely ignored Richard, immediately engaging an excited conversation with Mary. Yes, I've checked, there's enough propane, Mary confirmed to Noel as she carried a large container toward the backyard. I'll check it, Noel insisted abruptly. Oh sure, because I don't know how to operate my own grill, right? Richard muttered under his breath. Noel managed to lift the tank, confirmed that Richard was right, and then turned on the grill. She rapidly pressed the ignition switch multiple times. Hey, hey, what are you trying to do? Wreck it, Richard exclaimed. I'm trying to start it, Noel shouted back. Just press and hold it, Richard instructed tersely. Well, on mine, you need to. Noel started to argue. This isn't yours. This is mine, and it works just fine the way it is, Richard declared firmly. Noel followed Richard's instructions, and a moment later, the grill ignited with a whoosh. Maybe give it a thought. Richard hinted as Noel energetically placed the vegetable skewers on the lower part of the grill. What, you think I can't handle this? Noel retorted, casting a sharp look at Richard. All right, Richard replied with a smirk. Just don't come complaining to me when your skewers are stuck to the grill, he muttered to himself. Buddy and Jewel Cornwall were a young couple in their twenties. Buddy was thin, with prominent features like a large nose and protruding ears. Jewel had a fuller figure, with narrow shoulders and broad hips. Her choice of a halter top and shorts was questionable. Both worked in it and owned a Toyota Prius. Buddy immediately irritated Richard by mocking his extended cab pickup truck within minutes of arriving at the Trahan residence. He also arrogantly refused Richard's beer offer, stating his preference for dark beer exclusively. Buddy's opinion shifted when he learned that Richard was a high school football coach, although primarily a mathematics teacher at St. Pius. Do you really think football is just a brute game? Buddy asked disdainfully. Absolutely, Richard replied, feigning agreement. It's not about teaching teamwork, respect for rules, sportsmanship, decision-making, or strategic thinking. It's all about roughness and nothing more. When Noel went to turn the skewers, she discovered they were sticking to the grill, blaming the poor quality of the grill. I was about to suggest using some oil on the grill, but you seemed confident in your method, Richard remarked. Mary shot Richard a furious look, and Noel swore at him. Buddy, Jewel, and Chrissy all gave Richard disapproving stares. Richard also advised lowering the heat a bit, but Noel was reluctant to take his advice. However, she did end up generously applying oil to the grill before placing the rest of the skewers on it. Richard was enjoying his Benny's burger topped with blue cheese, jalapenos, grilled onions, and a slice of pineapple when his phone rang. He calmly finished his bite before answering. Yes, Mary. He inquired. What on earth are you doing? She demanded in a high-pitched tone. And why should I know? Richard responded. I'm sure Noel is more capable than I am for whatever you need. We're out of gas for the grill, Mary retorted sharply. You were supposed to check it. I did check it, and so did Noel. There was more than enough. If she had listened to me and turned the grill down, we would still have enough, Richard replied with a calm demeanor. Where exactly are you? Mary pressed. 
at Benny's Burger Bar, Richard answered. Did you know they have over a thousand ways to customize your burger here? An employee, tidying up a nearby table, turned to Richard with a broad grin. Richard returned the smile to the young woman. I recommend the Thai chili paste on it, the employee chimed in. And don't forget the onion straws. They're a must. What? Mary exclaimed. Why on earth are you at? But Richard had already ended the call. He continued to enjoy his burger, ignoring the subsequent ring of his phone. When I choose Thai chili, I top it with coleslaw, Richard mentioned as he moved towards the trash bin with his tray. Interesting. The employee remarked, eyeing the array of toppings. I should give that a try. The coleslaw helps balance the heat from the chili paste, Richard explained. As his phone rang yet again, Richard exited the restaurant with a shake of his head. What now, Mary? Richard inquired, opening his truck door. I am utterly humiliated, Mary shouted. We have guests, and you just take off. Your guests, not mine, Richard exhaled and started the engine. But I'll be back in ten minutes. Finally, there you are, Mary's voice pierced the air as she entered the house from the back just as Richard came in from the garage. Could you fetch the other tank from the basement? Richard asked calmly. There's another one. Mary retorted sharply. Why didn't you mention it earlier? I did, Richard replied. When I got them refilled, I told you we'd keep the spare in the basement. That's not true, Mary countered. Richard went down to the basement, located the spare tank, and carried it upstairs. Noel insisted on taking it from him. Richard handed it over, and she nearly lost her balance under its weight, though she wouldn't admit her struggle to Richard. He turned away, not offering help with replacing the old tank or setting up the new one. As Noel served the partially burnt, partially undercooked vegetable skewers, along with the now cold baked beans, solidified macaroni salad, and limp salad with a two tart vinaigrette, Richard raved about the hamburger he had at Benny's Burger Bar. We don't consume meat, Noel stated proudly. Do you realize how many toxins? I can see you don't eat meat, Richard interrupted. As for the toxins, I couldn't care less. Then Richard moved inside, pushing past Toby to enter the house and check his schedule on the St. Pius website. He collected the five textbooks he needed for the year and packed them into his leather bag. Feeling bored, he browsed the alley's upcoming events. Marcy Martin's show was announced, and tickets were already sold out. A spark of interest hit Richard when he saw Dennis Auerbe and the Benders listed for the next Tuesday night. He and Dennis had attended DeGuard High School together. Dennis, who was not only good-looking but also naturally charming, was something Richard had always envied. A proficient accordion player since he was 12, Dennis had performed with several Zydeco bands and even appeared on a few albums. He was known for his friendly and laid-back demeanor. Richard's heart sank knowing that Mary would probably refuse to go with him to the concert. She hadn't wanted to see Marcy Martin, so why would a Zydeco band concert be any different, even if an old school friend was leading it? Logging out, he then checked his bank account and noticed a new charge from Burns and Burns Grocery Store. It was clear Mary had been shopping for Jackie and Andy again. Richard had mentioned, and Mary had seemingly concurred, that as long as their financial obligations were met, Jackie and Andy would remain immature. A particular expense bothered him, a charge labeled ticket break for $96. It became clear that Chrissy and Noel hadn't purchased the Marcy Martin concert tickets as Mary had asserted. Since Mary was unemployed, it was essentially Richard who had funded the concert outing for the trio. Compelled by an unexplained urge, Richard browsed through Mary's Facebook profile, discovering her posts about the eagerly anticipated Marcy Martin concert and her plans to attend with her close friends. Richard murmured to himself, feeling sidelined, I thought I was supposed to be your best friend. Driven by a similar impulse, he looked up Amanda Wolf, also known as Mandy, on Facebook. Her profile featured personal updates, including her contentment with her independent life and her excitement about reconnecting with a former teacher. Richard noticed a post expressing Mandy's joy at having been remembered by Mr. Trek, complete with a photo of him she'd found online, which made Richard self-consciously reflect on his appearance. Mandy, content with her simplicity and independence, radiated happiness in her small world. On a routine workday, she impressed a customer with her polite demeanor, who appreciated her respectful responses, a rarity he found in younger people. Mandy, flattered by the compliment, credited her manners to her schooling and the recent reunion with her teacher, Mr. Trahan. As she reminisced fondly about Mr. Trahan, he unexpectedly appeared before her, flashing a charming smile. His casual inquiry about her old penny loafers and the sound of his voice stirred a mix of emotions in Mandy as she hurried to fetch the shoes, still under the spell of his presence. Guy was waiting the whole time you were busy, Colette, a colleague, mentioned to Mandy. He could have picked up those shoes himself, but he insisted on waiting for you. Is that so? Mandy responded, clearly pleased. Richard tried on the shoes again, checking their feel on the smooth floor. You know, Dennis Auerbe and his group are playing at the alley tomorrow night, Richard found himself saying to Mandy. I thought about going, thought about wearing my dress shoes, but then I remembered these are much more comfortable. Planning on dancing. I really don't want my feet to hurt afterward. Ah, Mandy sighed. Are you taking your wife out dancing? That's really sweet. Oh, uh, no, Mary won't be joining. She's not a fan of Zydeco, Richard explained. 
He almost added, she's not fond of me either, but I know for sure if Noel and Chrissy wanted to go, she'd be ready in no time. Zydeco. Mandy looked confused. What is that? It's a type of Cajun music, Richard informed her. Oh, Trehan. You're Cajun, Mandy realized. Would you like to come? Richard asked impulsively. Um, when is it? Mandy inquired, then quickly remembered. Oh, right, tomorrow night, right? Yes, confirmed Richard. Wait here for a second, Mandy told him and hurried to the back room. Richard then heard a joyous exclamation. Returning quickly, Mandy confirmed, I checked, and I'm free tomorrow night, so I can make it, she announced cheerfully. He had her put her address and phone number into his phone. Mary was still irked with him over a recent misunderstanding at home. Despite Richard's detailed explanation, showing how the situation was actually influenced by Noel's stubbornness, Mary still blamed him. Consequently, Mary had decided not to cook for Richard, which didn't bother him much. He was a competent cook and enjoyed his own meals. He had a penchant for dining out. Mary often criticized his choice of eateries. They lacked the sophistication and flair she desired. Richard inquired if Mandy was up for a quick meal before heading to the club. Oh, I'm just 20, will they let me in? Mandy questioned abruptly. Yes, they'll mark your hand with an X to indicate you can't purchase alcoholic beverages, Richard explained, signing the receipt for his shoes. Mr. Tryon, what should I wear? Mandy inquired. We'll be dancing, doing the jitterbug, two-step, so opt for something light and comfy. Something you can move freely in, Richard advised. Okay, see you tomorrow, Mandy exclaimed with excitement as Richard departed from the store. Really, for that gentleman, Colette inquired. Is that why you wanted to swap shifts? Absolutely, Mandy responded with enthusiasm. After their work, Mandy expressed her gratitude to Colette for the shift change. She then drove to her apartment in her 1994 Toyota Camry, hurried up the stairs, and unlocked her door. Following a quick dinner, Mandy turned on her computer to watch videos on Cajun dancing. Intrigued by the vigorous moves and the dancer's spirited steps, she realized she needed to choose her outfit carefully. She experimented with various tops and her favorite knee-length skirt, finally settling on a flattering scoop neck blouse. After selecting her comfortable flat shoes, which was a boon from working at a specialty shoe store, Mandy reflected on her choices in the mirror. Pondering over the large shoe size of Mr. Trahan, she mused, it's curious to think there's a connection with shoe size. Chiding herself, she thought, it's odd to call your companion Mr. Trahan. Then she reminded herself, it's not really a date. He's married and simply wants company because his wife isn't fond of Zydeco music. She put on another video and mimed the dancing, envisioning a man named Richard clasping her hands, engaging in the animated, stiff-legged dance, and the hips swiveling. Oh, I need to decide on the color of my underwear, she exclaimed as her lightweight skirt fluttered upwards. Red, or black, she pondered, or maybe the innocent girl white. She had a pair of white underwear that was particularly dainty, which she liked to pair with a matching bra. By 10.30, Mandy had her blouse and skirt ironed, her underwear and bra draped over the hangers, and her black shoes shined and ready. After turning off the ceiling light, Mandy slipped into her camisole top and matching light underwear, then laid down on her modest bed. Oh no, Mr. Richard. No, I'm not naive, she said aloud, fantasizing that he was beside her, softly caressing her thighs. I mean, it seems like everyone's interested in the plus-size girl, right? She said, her tone tinged with sadness. Sure, everyone notices the plus-size girl, but no one really cares to know her, right? As Mandy lay in bed, tracing her fingers along her thighs and imagining they were Richard's, Richard himself was explaining that he was going to the alley the next night to see Dennis Auerbe and the Benders. Mary showed no interest in Dennis Auerbe or Richard's reason for attending the accordion player's gig. She couldn't grasp why he needed a new pair of shoes for the event. They might come in handy for dancing, Richard suggested. These soles are so comfortable, it's like walking on a cloud. Two hundred dollars for shoes. They'd better dance for you, Mary remarked sharply. $174.59, Mary, Richard corrected her irritably. You ever notice when you buy something, the price seems lower. When I buy, it's like it jumps to the next hundred. And what if I wanted to do something tomorrow, huh? Mary challenged. Did you ever think of that? We haven't really done anything for what, a year? Two years. Why would tomorrow be any different? Richard retorted as he picked out his khakis and a blue duck head button-down shirt. But what if I had wanted to? Mary pressed, as he began to iron. Then I'd be more than willing to skip meeting an old buddy. I'd happily put aside my own plans to hang out with you, Richard fibbed. What's on your mind, Mary? What do you feel like doing tomorrow evening? I'm already getting my outfit ready for whatever you're up for. And who will you be dancing with? Mary inquired. What? You're not planning on. You better not be. The alley attracts all sorts of people. They're there, I'm there, the music's on, and I just ask if they'd like to dance, Richard explained, focusing intently on perfecting the crease in his trousers. When the song ends, I thank them and wait for the next one. That's all you should be doing, Mary warned. Feel free to join and see for yourself, Richard countered, aware she wouldn't. His thoughts then shifted. He carefully placed the trousers on the hanger. In a, $96. 
for ticket break. Richard queried. I thought you mentioned Noel. Mary headed towards the door. Toby, the cat, tried to settle on Richard's pillows. At the press of the steam button on the iron, a loud hiss filled the air, and Toby scampered away. The next morning, as Mary continued to sleep, Richard got up, took a shower, shaved, and got dressed. He then made breakfast just for himself, not bothering to prepare any extra for Mary. He knew she wouldn't have done the same for him, even if he was right there at the table while she cooked. At St. Pius, the staff exchanged greetings. Richard made it a point to welcome the two new faculty members. Mrs. Bonham caught his eye, her presence, he noted, would likely be distracting to the students. He estimated her age to be somewhere between late 30s and early 40s, still striking in appearance. Mr. Abramson, on the other hand, didn't seem to attract much attention. He was noticeably overweight. Stanley's for your shoes, right? Richard blurted out unexpectedly. Yes, sir, Ron Abramson responded, his expression brightening. You too. 14 triple E, Richard replied, pointing to his shoes. Actually, I was in line behind you at the store yesterday. Nine and a half triple E for me, Ron said with a smile. Though sometimes I can manage a 10 E, depending on the make. Why bother with all that hassle when Stanley has exactly what you need, right? Richard concurred. Monsignor tipped and led a prayer, seeking blessings for the faculty and students and wishing for a fruitful academic year. Following that, Assistant Principal Robert Driscoll welcomed the new faculty members, outlined their duties, and called for volunteers to oversee the drama club and the year's planned theatrical productions. Oh, how about we choose a Shakespeare play? It's always amusing how the students grumble about deciphering the language, Mr. Williams proposed with a twinkle in his eye. Perhaps you're suggesting, what, King Lear? Robert teased, maybe Richard III, Mrs. Bonham threw in, or the Merry Wives of Windsor. Another chimed in, just me. No way, Mr. Williams chuckled. Hold on, you're the math teacher and the football coach. Mrs. Bonham inquired of Richard with a playful tone, slightly leaning in and giving him a nudge. Richard noticed her large diamond ring but she seemed to overlook or dismiss his glance towards it. After receiving his classroom and desk keys from Robert Driscoll, Richard quickly left the office, hoping Mrs. Bonham didn't catch the room number he was assigned. In room 224, Richard felt pleased. The desk was robust and lockable. He secured the textbooks and placed a tall stool at the back of the classroom, a strategic spot for overseeing tests and curbing any cheating attempts. Upon leaving, he exchanged friendly goodbyes with Ron Abramson next door and Mrs. Bonham, who was heading to the parking lot. Back home, Mary lounged on the sofa, announcing, I've invited Noel, Chrissy, and Jewel over tonight. Really, I thought you were joining me at the alley tonight, Richard replied, his tone lightly veiled with surprise. Huh, oh, no, I mean, you didn't already buy the tickets, did you? Mary said, well, yes, I did. I mean, what was all that talk last night? Richard replied, no, I never said I was going, Mary retorted sharply. Fine, forget about it, Richard said tersely and walked to their bedroom. He smiled as he changed out of the formal clothes he'd worn for the meeting and hopped into the shower. He quickly washed and rinsed off. Looking in the mirror, Richard noticed new lines on his face and a sprinkling of gray in his hair. He pondered whether a new haircut might be in order. He recalled Father Tipton's buzz cut, which seemed to suit the gray. Let's see what Mandy thinks, he mused. He texted Mandy to say he was on his way. She replied with a brief K and he moved from the bedroom to the garage. I'm heading out to Rio del Sol, so no need to worry about any mess here, Richard called out to Mary. Actually, he intended to go to Benny's Burger Bar, yet he mentioned Rio del Sol knowing it was Mary's preferred Mexican spot. He shut the garage door before she could answer. Really, are we now trying to upset each other? Richard muttered to himself. He considered going back inside to say he was actually headed to Benny's Burger Bar but decided against it. He got into his truck and drove off. Richard arrived at the location Mandy had provided. It was peculiar because it looked more like a house than the apartment listed on her social media. As he was about to approach the front door, he heard a sound and saw Mandy hurrying down some metal steps towards him. Hey there, looking great, aren't you? Richard complimented. Thank you, Mandy responded, clearly pleased. You're dressed too elegantly for Benny's, Richard thought as he opened the passenger door for her. So, he did end up having dinner at Rio del Sol. During the meal, he conversed with Mandy. There was a significant age gap between them, she was nearer in age to his kids than to him. Richard realized he didn't even know what kind of music Jackie, Andy, or Peter liked, or what TV shows they enjoyed watching. Oh, I checked out some Zydeco music online. Mandy shared excitedly with Richard, her hands animatedly moving. And you still want to hang out with me? Richard asked, a smile playing on his lips. Are you kidding? I loved it. Mandy replied with enthusiasm. You've got to teach me those moves, they were so lively. It's quite easy, actually, Richard explained. Legend has it the jitterbug was created by a pirate with only one leg. He couldn't bend his leg, so he just stomped his foot and swung his hips. It really looked like that. Mandy exclaimed, her eyes sparkling with excitement. After dinner, they headed to the alley nightclub. They got in quickly, and Richard took care of the entrance fee. True to his word, Mandy's hand was marked with a large X. Pay up. Owe me ten. 
Richard shouted as his friend Dennis was about to start his performance. I bet the Saints would make it to the Super Bowl. Really? After what? 30 years? Dennis shouted back. Trahan, you old rascal. You look ancient. Don't they have mirrors back there? Richard retorted. The two friends shared a hearty laugh and embraced. Then Richard introduced Mandy simply as a friend, causing Dennis to smirk. It's about time you moved on from Mary, Dennis remarked. What dialect was that? Mandy inquired as Dennis returned to the stage. That's Cajun French, Richard said, chuckling. He leaned in to whisper to her. He was saying how charming you look, told him he doesn't need to tell me, I can see for myself, Richard playfully said. Oh, Mandy cooed, resting her head on his arm. This is the first track from our new album, What's She Doing Now? Dennis declared. He began performing a song about a guy waiting at home, speculating about his wife's questionable outings. Mandy wasn't familiar with the Cajun dance steps, yet she adeptly followed Richard's movements. They remained on the compact dance floor throughout the entire first set. Subsequently, Dennis guided Richard and Mandy to a quieter area. Wow, Mandy blurted out, wiping her forehead. Are you still teaching? Inquired Dennis. Yes, over at St. Pius, Richard confirmed. How about the kids? Dennis probed. Jackie and Andy. Not sure. Last I checked, they were just loitering. Always asking for money, Richard shared. And Peter. He's over at Missouri River State. Same old story with the handouts. Kids, right. Remarked Dennis. My tea boy's out shrimping. They say it pays well, but he can't seem to keep any of it. And Belle. Always, Daddy, I need this, Daddy, I need that. And naturally, Daddy obliges, chuckled Richard, as the two friends exchanged a playful shoulder pat. Regardless of being underage, Mandy ended up with a beer in her hand, which she downed quickly, followed by an unexpected loud burp. And what about you? How did he end up with a charming Cajun lady like you here? Dennis teased Mandy. Me. I'm not Cajun, Mandy protested, thankful her burp went unnoticed. What you must be, Dennis countered, observing her dance. Only Cajuns have that rhythm. No, really, I'm not, Mandy insisted. I mean, I did some online research, but, well, I'm officially declaring you Cajun now. Dennis proclaimed. Let's hear an A. A. The crowd responded. And an E. Dennis continued. Wow. Everyone cheered and laughed together. And what does that spell? Dennis shouted, gearing everyone up for the next round of performance. Wow. The crowd echoed. Now you're one of us, baby girl, Dennis proclaimed. Hey, boss man. Let's give baby girl one of our CDs, all right. After their performance, Mandy was visibly tired. Richard felt the same, the excitement had taken its toll on him as well. He and Dennis shared a warm embrace. Mandy, flushed and glowing from the excitement, received a friendly hug from Dennis, who playfully reminded her of her newfound cultural connection and gave her a friendly peck on the cheek. Oh my goodness, this is unbelievable, absolutely amazing. Mandy gushed as they walked to the truck. Opening the passenger door for her, Richard received a heartfelt hug from Mandy. Her head rested against his chest in a moment of gratitude. Thank you so much, she expressed warmly. You're welcome. I'm happy you enjoyed it, Richard replied. He assisted her into the truck and as he walked around to the driver's side, he noticed Mandy had moved over to unlock his door as well. Standing outside Mandy's apartment, Richard gently declined an invitation inside, showing his wedding ring with a regretful smile. Well, I uh, Mandy hesitated on the doorstep. Good night, Richard said, offering a brief embrace. Hey, could you turn around? Mandy called after him as he descended the steps. Turning back, Richard saw her smile warmly, her dimples showing. Looks like we're on the same level now, Mandy noted. Then, steadying herself against the handrail, she leaned in and gave Richard a gentle, fleeting kiss on the lips before hurrying into her apartment. Despite feeling completely worn out, to the point where her abdomen ached, Mandy went online and shared her night's experiences on her Facebook. Afterward, she took a shower. Lying in bed, dressed in her comfortable nightwear, Mandy found herself needing to unwind and relax before she could fall asleep. While Mandy was settling down for the night, Richard was in his shower, lost in thoughts of their recent embrace. The memory of their closeness and her gentle touch lingered with him. Back in the bedroom, Mary appeared to be asleep, or perhaps pretending, when Richard entered. Toby had taken over Richard's side of the bed, and Darren was at the foot, monopolizing the blanket. Out of the way, you pesky critters, Richard muttered as he moved Toby. Darren quickly escaped before Richard could reach him. Richard had no clue about Samantha's whereabouts and didn't bother to find out. The following day marked the beginning of a new school year, and Richard was busy welcoming newcomers and catching up with returning students. Mrs. Bonham made a couple of visits to his office, leaning in a bit too close, but Richard maintained eye contact without faltering. During lunch, Richard patrolled the school corridors, checking for any signs of smoking. After a quick tour of the cafeteria, he headed to the staff lounge, where he prepared his healthy lunch of fruit cocktail and protein mix, stirring it with milk. What's that you're having? Mrs. Bonham inquired, leaning over him to get a better look at his meal. Just my lunch, Richard replied. By the end of the week, Richard was contemplating filing a complaint against Olivia Bonham for her persistent and unwelcome advances. That evening, upon arriving home, Mary announced their plans to visit Rio del Sol. 
We are, Richard responded, surprised yet compliant. All right, just give me a moment to get ready. No, no, it's just Noel, Chrissy, and me, Mary clarified, slightly off balance as she attempted to slip into her shoes. Ah, I see, Marcy Martin, Richard chimed in, a hint of mischief in his voice. Since we're the ones who bought the tickets, maybe you can convince them to cover your dinner, eh? Mary offered no reply, no goodbye gesture, not even a simple farewell as she exited the house. Stan Murdoch had a firm policy at his shop. He didn't approve of his staff being glued to their cell phones during work hours. Whether it was messaging, browsing, or gaming, he believed that time on the clock meant work, not play. Even in the absence of customers, there was always something to do, tidying up the displays, replenishing the stock of shoe polish, or organizing the shoelaces. When Mandy's phone unexpectedly chimed, she quickly checked to make sure Mr. Murdoch hadn't noticed before sneaking a peek at the message. Though, she couldn't help but feel a rush of excitement. Meet for dinner at 7, I'll have a half hour, she typed back with speed. Benny's Burger Bar, came Richard's voice through his text-to-speech app. Okay, was the swift response. I'll pick you up at 7, Richard confirmed. Mandy made sure to inform Mr. Murdoch about her dinner plans, hinting she might be a tad late returning from her break. Mr. Murdoch, understanding as always, smiled at her diligence. He saw her as a valuable member of the team, appreciating her hard work despite her youth and inexperience. If you're going to be a few minutes late, just head out a few minutes early tonight to balance it out, he suggested with a light-hearted tone. That doesn't quite add up, she laughed, her cheeks dimpling with the smile. Watching her interact with a customer, Stan thought to himself about how bright and vibrant Mandy was, a sentiment tinged with his own unspoken thoughts about her appearance. Richard was just about to head into Stanley's to fetch Mandy when she appeared, full of energy. She grabbed onto the truck's handle, her voice hurried. Sorry to rush, I've only got 30 minutes. Don't worry, Benny's is pretty quick with orders, Richard reassured her, and they were off. Absolutely, it's one of my top picks, Mandy concurred. There's over a thousand ways to customize your burger, Richard mentioned. I'm pretty simple, Mandy confessed. I just add guacamole and a heap of jalapenos. I go for blue cheese, Richard began. Ugh, the smell of that stuff, Mandy exclaimed. How can you stand it? A bit of jalapenos, some grilled onions, Richard went on. And to balance the heat, a big slice of pineapple. The parking lot was nearly empty. Mandy surprised and delighted Richard by taking his hand as they queued. It had been ages since Mary had shown him such a gesture. Half pound, medium, with fries and root beer, Mandy ordered. Half pound, very well done, so much that it's almost a shame to serve it, with fries and sweet tea, Richard specified, paying with his card. Oh, don't overcook it, it loses all its taste, Mandy playfully objected. Finding a booth, Richard was taken aback to see Olivia Bonham. Beside her was a man in a wheelchair. Away from school, Olivia no longer seemed the vibrant figure, instead, she looked weary. She ate her burger, avoiding eye contact with her companion. Number 14. Called the server, presenting their food. You're just a few feet away, Richard teased her. You could have just said hey you. Hey you, she replied. Come over here. Mandy frowned at her burger, muttering about the server's attitude. What's wrong? Richard almost chuckled, deciding to add some Thai chili paste and slaw to his burger. Is she flirting with you right in front of me? Mandy questioned, her eyes sparking with irritation. That night, Mandy reflected on her Facebook page. I know it wasn't exactly a date, but apart from our trip to the alley to see Dennis Auerbe and the Benders, it was one of the best outings I've had. Richard grinned as he scrolled through the post. Mandy had shared an account of her evening with Dennis Auerbe, complete with a scanned image of the CD cover. A few months back, Richard had attended the Taste of Benhurst Festival with Mary since Noel and Chrissy were unavailable. To onlookers, Richard and Mary appeared as just acquaintances. No affectionate gestures or exchanges were evident. Furthermore, Mary never acknowledged their day out on her social media. Richard had spent a significant sum on the event, including a bottle of wine Mary enjoyed, yet received no social media recognition. Conversely, an inexpensive meal led to Richard receiving a detailed and enthusiastic post about their outing. And there was that brief moment by Stanley's, a simple peck on the lips from Mandy, whereas Mary parted for the concert without even a good night. At 11.14 p.m., Richard's phone alerted him. Half asleep, he saw an image of Mary and Chrissy in a close embrace, which unsettled him. He hesitated, then chose not to delete the provocative photo. Another alert at 11.17 p.m. showed a more intimate moment between Mary and Noel. Despite the compromising situation in the photo, Richard noticed they were still at the alley bar, identified by the neon sign's reflection. Several more explicit images arrived, showing his wife and her friends in compromising positions. Richard silenced his phone to avoid further disturbances. The next morning, Richard casually inquired about the concert, to which Mary responded indifferently. Her lack of enthusiasm irked him, especially considering the cost of the event. When Mary criticized his spending on a concert, Richard's smirk only annoyed her further. She quickly shifted the conversation to mundane household tasks. Then tell Jackie or Andy to get moving and handle it, Richard retorted sharply. The lawnmower's just sitting there in the tool shed, for heaven's sake. 
They're at Marilee Lake, Mary replied, as though that settled the matter. But Jackie mentioned they received a notice from the county. Oh, my, God, Richard exploded. Can you see it? Can you see what you're letting them become? Richard did head over to the old house. Trey Deems, Walter Deems III, came over from across the street when he saw Richard pulling up. Rich, hey Rich, I don't mean to step on your toes about how to manage your kids, Trey began as he approached. Then don't, Richard cut in sharply, eyeing the overgrown grass. Maybe when you've got kids of your own, you can give me advice, all right. What usually took Richard a couple of hours ended up consuming nearly six. The lawnmower was practically falling apart by the time he was done with the unruly grass. He caught glimpses of Jackie's car driving by with Andy, clearly trying to avoid a face-off with their dad. After a grueling six hours, Richard, drained and sweaty, couldn't bear to check the state of the house's interior. He just threw his towel over the car seat and drove off. Where have you been? Mary launched into him as soon as he lumbered in, exhausted and drenched in sweat. Hold off, Mary, Richard cautioned her. It doesn't take all day to mow the lawn, she protested. Mary, the grass was knee-high. Yes, it does take six hours, not eight, but six, to mow when it's that tall. It was so overgrown we got a notice from the county. It takes that long, Richard roared. Maybe if you did a bit of yard work yourself, you'd understand. You'd know how long these things take. I do work, Mary began. Richard ran his finger down the TV screen, collecting dust on his fingertip. I cleaned the TV, Mary claimed, after Richard finally got out of the shower, exhausted. Do you expect applause for that? Richard quipped as he dried off. He slipped into a fresh pair of boxers and a cozy t-shirt. Given you've been home all day, I assume the TV would be spotless, he remarked. After Mary exited, Richard remembered he had muted his phone. Glancing at his screen, he noticed three new pictures had been sent his way, accompanied by a cheerful emoji from Mandy and a simple hi. The next images displayed Mary in her car's rear seat, her face obscured, her distinctive rings and the tattoo on her lower back identifiable. Richard shifted his focus back to the emoji, its simplicity bringing him a slight smile. Hi, I'm not sure about this emoji business, he admitted aloud to his voice to text app. I can teach you, offered Mandy. Just got done with some yard work at my children's place. I'm too drained right now, he typed back. Mandy replied with a disappointed emoji, to which Richard smiled weakly before closing his eyes, attempting to block out the visuals of Mary and her escapades. My comment, I don't think OP is a spineless wimp. I think he's a guy who keeps it under tight control because he knows if he lets it go, people are going to get seriously screwed or worse. Maybe gone. I've known guys like him, they put up with a lot of crap until they just can't and then it gets real ugly real fast. I guess we will see what he will do in the ending tomorrow.